Convidamos ao palco o doutor Hugh Katz, PhD em linguagem pela Florida State University dos Estados Unidos para a palestra Identificação Precoce da Dislexia. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I was here in uh, Bel Horizonte three years ago and quite enjoyed myself. It's uh, nice to be invited back, and I'd like to thank the organizers of this uh, conference to have done so. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about the early identification of dyslexia. Uh, it's a topic that I've been interested in for most of my career. Uh, the primary reason for that is that dyslexia is a serious developmental disability uh, that's associated with numerous negative consequences. Uh, the reading problems that are found in dyslexia often cause academic failure, which uh, goes on to cause uh, psycho, uh, psychological difficulties, everything from poor self-concept to more serious psychological problems. We also see an increase in substance abuse, uh, truancy, delinquency, uh, limited employment opportunities, and so forth. Well, this need not be the, be the case. Uh, we have good evidence that early intervention has an effect on, on the reading abilities of children that uh, are at risk for reading problems. Uh, and if we address those problems, we can limit the negative consequences of the disorder. But the problem is, if you're going to do early intervention, it means you're going to have to identify kids in a timely fashion. And that turns out to be a difficult uh, a problem because it means predicting the future. And it's very difficult to predict the future, uh, particularly when you're dealing with a complex developmental disability such as dyslexia. So in the past, it's often been the case that we waited for children uh, to enter school, uh, begin to be taught to read, and have reading problems before we identify them. That's known as the wait and fail approach. Uh, uh, that works, but the problem is the child's already experienced perhaps a couple of years of reading difficulties, and you've already started the cascade of negative consequences. But the research in the last 20 years or so has shown us that we can identify children at risk prior to their entering uh, uh, school and being uh, uh, given formal instruction, and that's what I'm going to talk about this afternoon. Uh, there's a number of early indicators of risk for dyslexia. Uh, perhaps the earliest which can occur before birth, and that's in family history. We know that about 40 to 60 percent of children with a parent or a sibling with dyslexia ends up having dyslexia themselves. There's a strong genetic basis to dyslexia. It's not a single gene. We're going to find that the, a single gene is the, is the cause of the problem in all, in all cases. It looks like in the last uh, few years we've identified as many as 20 genes or gene locations that seem to be associated with dyslexia. Each seems to have a small to a moderate effect, and what it is is the interplay of a variety of genes that leads to the uh, dyslexia condition. Uh, genes also interact with the environment, and family history captured that as well, because siblings uh, often share the same environment, and parents and child to a certain extent do that as well. So the variable of family history captures information about environment in addition to genes. We've learned other things about, uh, about family history. We know that the family history has a more continuous impact than, than we once thought. We, use, we thought that either you got the gene or you didn't get the gene for dyslexia. And it looks like that the, that the transmission of the, of the problem is more continuous in that we find that unaffected children in families with dyslexia often have reading problems themselves, milder reading problems such that they don't get identified. We find that family history is also noted in language development, so that uh, children in, in families with a family history have a higher incidence of language problems, particularly phonological difficulties. And interestingly enough, those phonological difficulties are also spread across the family. Unaffected children also, also seem to have uh, some difficulties in the phonological domain. And then finally, 
uh, we found that, that the variable of, of family history seems to account for individual differences in reading over and above variables that we might have measured like uh, early uh, letter knowledge or early um, abilities in the phonological or language domain, suggesting that family history may be picking up on other cognitive or environmental factors that we typically don't uh, measure for in early identification. So the point being that family history is a good early indicator of potential risk for reading disabilities. There's also early behavioral indications of of risk for reading problems. Reading is a linguistic activity, so it shouldn't be surprising to find that uh, uh, during the preschool years, children at risk for reading problems have language difficulties. Uh, the one that we pay, we pay most attention to is phonological processing difficulties. But during the preschool years, it looks like that problems in, in other uh, aspects of language are more prominent, more easily to identify uh, uh, during those years than problems in phonological processing, and those are difficulties in vocabulary or, or grammar. Uh, we see this problem in late talkers. Uh, late talkers are kids that have less than 50 words or no two word combinations by age two. Uh, they have normal hearing and normal IQ. Uh, as, as practitioners, I know you're often asked by uh, colleagues or friends about children who, who they're worried about who aren't talking by age two. Uh, and we find that for the most part, those children turn out to develop normally. They're a little later to start talking, but they have a normal development. But some of those kids are at risk for later language and reading problems. And we can see this in the data for uh, dyslexia. Uh, normal talkers are at risk for having uh, dyslexia. And the research shows that, that being a late talker with no other risk factor increases that risk, but only slightly, maybe a 10% increase, uh, uh, or up to 10% uh, probability of having a reading disability. But Heike Lindman in uh, Finland, actually at Uvascula, uh, has shown that uh, if, if a child is a late talker, and he has a family history, or she has a family history, she may be much higher risk for reading problems. And they went on to show that if you're a late talker and you have receptive language problems and a family history, you have a very high probability of having uh, dyslexia. You also have a high chance of having a specific language impairment. It's a disorder that involves delayed onset and protracted development of language, which is measured by morphology, uh, semantics, uh, phonology, uh, discourse, et cetera. Uh, these kids are usually identified uh, between three and five years of age. And there's quite a large literature out there looking at the relationship between uh, specific language impairments and uh, dyslexia. I've been fortunate enough to be involved in one of the largest studies of, of kids with specific language impairment. Uh, we studied uh, over 200 children with language impairments, identified them in kindergarten and followed them through the 10th grade. And it was an epidemic logic study in that we had a representative sample of children and found that there was approximately 20 to 30 percent of the children with SLI that ended up with, with dyslexia. Uh, the numbers are a bit higher in some of the clinical-based samples, uh, uh, two of which, MacArthur and, and uh, uh, Frank here did a study showing that it's closer to 50 percent if you take kids that have been seen by clinicians, uh, SLI uh, children, by clinicians, they have a higher rate, maybe 50% or so end up with dyslexia. And then above that, uh, we'll see some kids on the borderlines of being identified as dyslexia, or having dyslexia, but there's still a large portion of children with SLI that don't end up having a word reading problem, suggesting that these two disorders are distinct in nature, uh, although comorbid. The fact that they're comorbid allows you to sh use uh, the condition of SLI as an early indicator of uh, potential for developing dyslexia. Now to the, the, the more commonly uh, known developmental uh, language problem associated with dyslexia is a phonological processing uh, difficulty. We see problems in phonological awareness, lack of awareness of, of rhyme and alliteration, problems on uh, sound, making sound judgments, uh, phonological memory is a difficulty in, in children uh, 
that have dyslexia, poor short-term memory, uh, problems following directions, uh, difficulties learning new words so that uh, second language learning can be a, a, a real difficulty for a child with, with dyslexia. It's typically tested by having children produce uh, new words, uh, non-words. Uh, the other problems we see is in, pro in phonological retrieval, uh, word finding difficulties, problems recalling names, and tested by a, rat a rapid automatized naming task where you name a series of letters, objects, uh, numbers, etc. A fourth domain where we see problems is in phonological production. Now that's not the problems that we see developmentally that extend some in some children with articulation impairments such that in English you would say wabbit instead of rabbit or fist instead of fish, but it's more often seen in the production of multisyllabic words so that a child in English might say minimum rather than minimum or suspific rather than specific. Uh, those errors tend to be uh, 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 peri periodic or they, they don't occur every time the child produces the word, uh, but they're nevertheless are there. We also see tongue twisters in children with uh, problems with tongue twisters in children with dyslexia. Uh, for example, again in English, saying the word Swiss wristwatch is, is particularly problematic for a child with dyslexia. Uh, they also show uh, frequent use of uh, malapropisms. A malapropism is where you use a word that's pronounced like another word but means something very different. Now, the, the phonological problems that we see occur in many children with dyslexia, but not all children. So what we might say is that it is a, I'm sorry, I, I got ahead of myself. Uh, let's just move on to that. We might say that it's a near necessary cause of dyslexia. Uh, not only is it not a necessary cause, it's not a sufficient cause of the condition either but because we find many children who have phonological processing problems or at least a few that have phonological processing problems that do not develop uh, dyslexia. Re recall back to the studies, family studies where we find that the non-affected siblings often have difficulties in the phonological domain. So it's, it's likely that there's other factors there that either increase or decrease the likelihood of dyslexia. Uh, Maggie Snowling and her group suggested it might be early language difficulties that are the factors that add to uh, the conditions of phonological processing. Others have said that if you have a problem in in phonological awareness, it's difficulties in rapid naming that lead to you expressing yourself in terms of having difficulties in, in word reading. But we could turn this around and look at it in terms of protective factors. A protective factor is a factor that offsets the, the risk factors. The other important part of a protective factor is that it's a moderator. What a moderator is, is a, it's a factor that has little effect on the behavior of concern unless there's risk involved, something like this. Uh, the the uh, notion of a protective factor uh, is often talked about in models of risk and resilience uh, by individuals such as uh, Rutter and, and others. Uh, they talk about uh, uh, risk factors uh, such as a phonological difficulty can increase your risk for the reading problems associated with dyslexia, but you also have factors that are protective or uh, vulnerability factors, and those are factors that come into play only if other risk factors are there. And so Snowling suggests that SLI might be one of those factors, that it impacts the, the, uh, the effect on reading uh, when other factors are, are present, and it seems to work pretty well in English uh, in the sense that we do find kids with SLI but with no other risk factors that seem to do well in, in learning to read words. However, if we looked at other languages, perhaps languages like Chinese, where morphological uh, awareness turns out to be more important than phonological awareness, we might expect that SLI might be considered better as a risk factor rather, rather than a moderator in the condition. Another potential moderator might be attention, such that if you have good attention plus phonological difficulties, you may be okay. But if you have attention deficit disorder, that can add to your, 
to your difficulties. There's other risk factors as well for, uh, for uh, dyslexia, and those may be in the visual domain. There's quite good evidence of a, of a, of a problem in the magnocellular uh, pathway. Uh, this is a pathway uh, that's impor particularly important for uh, uh, activities such as reading. It's, it detects uh, uh, change in the, in the visual field or motion in the visual field and is thought to be responsible for, uh, for uh, temporal processing in, uh, uh, in reading. Um, and there, there's evidence from a number of studies of deficits there. There's also uh, deficits been not noted in visual attention. Uh, some studies suggesting problems in attention span, uh, how many words you can hold in, in, in uh, memory at a, at a particular moment in time, or some sort of a sluggish system to where, to where, where you're attending to one word, another word, and you move to the other word, you get some crossover in, in the vision, or what some people talk about is visual crowding, and the attempt to, to deal with that is to move the words further, further apart. Uh, we may have, some of you may have heard of scotopic sensitivity syndrome. That's a problem with reading under certain light conditions, and it's, it's uh, treated by using colored lenses. Right? Uh, the problem is, is deciding what to make of these different uh, problems that we see with vision. Some of the problems might actually be causal factors in reading. There's a small portion of individuals with dyslexia that don't seem to have phonological difficulties, and it may, in those cases, be visually based. But in other situations, these problems may be moderators of, of, the, of the reading problem, in the sense that if you have a reading problem and you have one of these visual problems, it's more likely that you'll show the reading, uh, reading difficulties uh, uh, themselves. That has the implications to mean that, that if it is a moderator, do you intervene with it when in fact there's no, the other risk factors are not present? There's other behavioral problems associated with dyslexia. Uh, we know that dyslexics often have problems with fine and gross motor uh, uh, activities. Uh, uh, developmental coordination disorder is often associated with uh, dyslexia. Dyslexics are noted to have balance problems. There's now a, a large literature showing uh, difficulties in sp procedural learning. That's where we ask the individual to learn a task. It involves a sequence, number of different components. Dyslexics seem to be slower at learning the task and, and uh, later to automatize the task. Uh, there's other individuals, Angela, um, who've argued that this is due to a, a problem with the cerebellum and that that uh, contributes to difficulties in procedural learning, which has problems in, in uh, balance and in uh, fine and gross motor uh, development, and even in phonological processing. It's a very interesting uh, theory that ties together uh, a number of different uh, problems that we see in, in dyslexia. Uh, the problem is that the, that the direct tests of it still remain pretty mixed. We find quite a few people that are not finding some of the problems that this theory would expect them uh, to, to have. Um, and so I think it, at this point it remains a pretty intriguing idea and one that I think we're going to need to follow to see what role it plays in developmental dyslexia. Um, now, uh, not all children uh, with, who end up with, with dyslexia will show these early signs. Um, and some of them will show these signs but not be picked up by teachers. Therefore, it's become very common in, uh, in, in many countries, such as the U.S., to do universal screening, that is, screen children for potential risk factors uh, as they come to school. Uh, the measures that we might use are things such as print awareness, which includes uh, uh, letter knowledge, uh, phonological awareness, rapid naming, uh, uh, maybe a, uh, initial word reading ability, and we're now starting to screen more often for vocabulary because of the entrance of the relationship between uh, early difficulties in language and not only dyslexia, but difficulties in uh, reading comprehension. Uh, the, the methods used to, to do this screening uh, sometimes in, involve the flip chart or pencil and paper, but more recently we've moved to computer presentation of of the stimuli. The nice thing about computer presentation is you can do it in an adaptive fashion. 
That is, you can determine what the next item is going to be based upon what the child did with a previous item. And we can get to an idea of, uh, of the, uh, the child's strength or weaknesses in, in a particular set of behaviors quite quickly. An example of a, of a methodology that uses that or a screening measure is one that by my colleagues at, at Florida State, it's the Florida Assessment of Instruction and Reading called the FAIR. And they use a set of measures that can give you strengths and weaknesses in a, in a relatively short period of time. Five to ten minutes you can get an idea of the child's risk for reading problems. Um, and there's been quite a few studies uh, showing that uh, early screening can be effective. Uh, some of the studies uh, uh, initially showed that, that you have to wait till first grade to be able to, to identify uh, potential reading problems with the accuracy that we might like. But more recently, it looks that we can do this at the beginning of kindergarten. Uh, in fact, in a, a recent study that's in press at the, at the moment, uh, my colleagues and I showed that if we, if we give children a battery of uh, letter identification, uh, sound matching, non-word repetition, we can ha uh, predict word reading at the end of first grade with a moderately high uh, level of accuracy. Um, uh, most of the screening measures that, that I've talked about here are static measures, that is, each item is presented just once with no feedback. Well, more recently, we've also moved to testing reading using a dynamic assessment. That is, while you're testing, you provide the child with feedback or instruction. Uh, it measures one's potential to learn. Uh, one uses a standard protocol, that is, the same instructions for every child, with the same uh, feedback provided and what you measure is how much in feedback or instruction is needed for the child to learn their particular task. Uh, one that we've been doing is a task where we teach children uh, a new alphabet using uh, uh, figures such as this. We teach them two vowels and three consonants and measure how long it takes them to learn the new alphabet as well as it, how long it takes them to read uh, the particular uh, words over here. So this would be read how? Eat, and this would be read mace. Right? And then we measure how long it takes them to learn a series of those, uh, those words. The idea is it's just a beginning decoding task. We got the approach from uh, a colleague, Karsten Elbro, who did this in Denmark uh, 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 as a way of telling whether adult uh, dyslexics uh, had a real reading problem or whether their reading difficulty was the result of a second language. And uh, we think it has potential to be used with preschoolers and we're in the process of using that uh, uh, now. And there's a number of other people that have started to use dynamic assessment. Well, we can take dynamic assessment and spread it out into a longer period of instruction before we measure response to to that instruction, and that approach is known as response to intervention. Response to intervention is, a, is an approach that's been introduced to, uh, for early identification and prevention of learning disabilities, including uh, dyslexia. The approach is a tiered approach or multi-stage approach. In tier one, uh, children are provided with, um, with quality reading instruction, and then we uh, measure their, their response to the instruction using universal screening uh, task. Those who fail the task are provided with targeted interventions, usually in small groups in what we call tier two. Uh, some of those children go on to have difficulties um, and they receive more individ individualized instruction with more specialized uh, training. Well, this approach has been adopted uh, 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 across the uh, U.S. by teachers because it, it's an approach that, that helps provide the right instruction for the particular child. Right? However, it was originally developed for the purpose of identifying individuals with learning disabilities. And it seems to fit quite well there because the intervention is actually the assessment, the diagnosis emerges from the effort to intervene, the non-responders then turn out to be your true dyslexics. They're kids who do not respond to instruction despite the best efforts of general education. And there's a bit of, ev a bit of research today looking at individuals who are non-responders and looking at the, uh, 
characteristics of those children. There's a bit on the brain development of the non-responders. Uh, non uh, but it's those children that might be identified as, as having dyslexia. Well, on the surface, it seems like a good idea. What better way there is to identify a learning disability than problems learning, right? Uh, however, it, it has had some challenges from a, a number of different people. The psychologists don't like response to intervention because it doesn't involve invo uh, measuring cognitive or neuropsychological abilities. Uh, many think that one needs to do these types of tests to identify uh, how to intervene with, with reading problems. But the evidence out there suggests that, that knowing what the child's cognitive profile uh, to, a, to a, a large extent provides us with very little information about how to teach them to read words. Right. Uh, the major problems with the response to the intervention approach for using it as a method to identify kids with dyslexia are more psychometric approaches. Right? How do we go about doing this? Because now what the benchmark is that we compare reading ability to is instruction. Instruction is very different to quanti difficult to quantify. Before we had IQ, we could get a number, we could look at the IQ, look at the reading ability, and quite easily get a difference. Now we're trying to quantify reading and compare it to how well the child's reading. Even if we could come up with a number, that number is likely to differ when you go from one teacher to another teacher, one school system to another school system. So although response to intervention, I think, offers our best method for identifying kids who really do have a, a brain-based uh, disorder uh, uh, in reading, it has some challenges if we're going to try to come up with a way to uh, actually measure this in a way that will replicate itself from, from one study to the next or from one school district to the next. How am I doing for time? All right, a couple of final words about uh, early intervention. I, I, I say this because it's critical if we're going to do early identification that we match it with early intervention, right? That we don't want to be out there in the schools testing thousands of kids to see if they're at risk for dyslexia unless we have a system in place to address their needs. Right? And uh, we do know today what it is that we should do with these children, but we need to make sure that those, uh, that those uh, uh, activities and programs are in place. And just briefly, you're going to hear more about uh, what, uh, what we know works with kids with dyslexia but we know that the most effective interventions are the interventions that provide direct instruction about how the code works. In alphabetic languages, it means teaching how letters and letter combinations represent phonemes in an explicit, systematic, supportive, intensive way, and providing the child with opportunities to practice those so that you develop the automaticity that, that was talked about this morning. We also want to make sure that our intervention goes beyond the word level because many children who later develop dyslexia also have language difficulties. We want to address those not only because language problems are a moderator of dyslexia, a potential moderator, but because language problems present a serious uh, difficulties for later reading comprehension. Now, even with our best intervention that's out there today, we still find that there are non-responders. We're finding that, that a small percentage of kids still don't seem to, to respond to the interventions that are being provided. Uh, we're not sure why that is. What, is. what is it about the types of interventions that we're, get, we're providing that are not effective? Uh, one of my colleagues, Don, Don Compton, suggests that the that the uh, interventions don't go far enough, that what we tend to do in, in uh, reading instruction is, is rely on context uh, independent phonological rules. That is, we teach a set of, of translation rules, but we don't teach enough information. Uh, he says that we need to work more on context dependent uh, phono uh, uh, phonological orthographic uh, rules, and perhaps have a set corpora of words that are practiced and and automatize so that the child will go on to be able to use the self-teaching mechanisms that they have to learn to read. Well, beyond that, 
we're still going to have to follow kids through the schools, and dyslexics have more problems than reading words. They have difficulties that affect their listening, so problems within the classroom. Uh, note taking is particularly, dif particularly difficult for individuals with developmental dyslexia, uh, not only because of handwriting and spelling problems, but particularly because of phonological memory difficulties. Uh, other problems in writing, difficulties in math, and, and then finally difficulties in second language learning. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure whether we're going to have time for questions or not. Brief. Any questions, just briefly? No, I th in that case, I think we'll go and have our coffee. As pessoas que queiram fazer perguntas, por favor, fiquem de pé e a nossa recepcionista levará o microfone até, por favor, aqui na terceira fila. Hello, um, my name is Caroline. I'm a PhD in neuroscience and behavior, and my main research area is dyslexia. But even now, I don't know exactly how to define dyslexia. Here, it says it is a language disorder, and you have said a lot of many different um, cases like language disorder, um, phonological disorders. How do you think it's, um, how do you think we should describe dyslexia? Yes, uh, that's one of the big challenges in the field is, is how to define the condition. Um, the dyslexia is associated with a whole range of, uh, of problems, uh, but most people in the field uh, address, are particularly concerned with the word reading difficulties in dyslexia, right? And identifying uh, uh, dyslexia on that basis usually identifies, uh, involves identifying kids that have problems in reading, right? Despite adequate instruction, right? Again, that's difficult to measure, but we typically uh, do it on the basis of the fact that the child's been in school, has attended school, and has had the level of instruction that other individuals have not. In the past, we put IQ into it and compared IQ versus instruction, right? IQ is not the best predictor of later reading, nowhere near as good as, as uh, instruction in that case, right? So I usually suggest to people that one me measures word reading ability directly and use, uh, use that to identify kids with, with reading problems, uh, with uh, uh, providing that they have had uh, the instruction that's, that's expected for those children, both in terms of grade and their age. Well, I, I don't know who's in command here, but uh, let's go and have some coffee. <laughs> yes. What's that? Coffee? <laughs> Let's Nós temos uma pergunta que será feita em português, professor. Not to delay the coffee, but I think the there's a very simple way to measure dyslexia, and that's accuracy and fluency of reading words and non-words. And that works in most languages. Uh, the fluency or speed of reading is particularly important in uh, languages that are more regular in the correspondence between letters and sounds. Nós teremos agora uma pergunta em português e o professor já está a postos. 
É, boa tarde. Eu trabalho numa escola e nós temos muitos alunos com diagnóstico de síndrome de Irley. O senhor falou sobre a questão da dificuldade é, relacionada à visão em pessoas com dislexia. Eu queria saber a opinião do senhor sobre a síndrome de Irley. Can you say the syndrome again? If I, may, if I may have another moment, I think Dr. Stein is trying to give me the hook. And <laughs> either that or he, he would like his coffee. <laughs> um, but the question had to do with the Erlen uh, syndrome, which is a uh, scotopic sensitivity syndrome. And that's the problem with that some people report that under certain light conditions they get headaches. Other people say that words get meshed together, run off the page, and so forth. All right? Uh, the, the research seems to suggest that the condition exists. Uh, my concern is, what does it have to do with reading and dyslexia? Right? I think the best evidence suggests that it's a moderator, if at all, a, a factor in the condition. That is, that, that if one has uh, the Erlen syndrome, one might be fine unless you have other difficulties, such as a phonological processing problem or other causal factors. Right? Uh, without those other causal factors, the, uh, the uh, scotopic sensitivity may cause headaches, right? Um, and one might be able to, to get, use the lenses to help address those, but they're unlikely to do anything with reading performance. Agradecemos ao Dr. Hugh Katz pelas suas palavras.